Thank you. I count it a, an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. And uh, yes, I am a Montreal Canadiens fan. Two years ago, I was very happy with their playing. Last year, no. This year, no. But I have this to say to you. Wait till next year. I'm not sure how many years I'll be saying that. So as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you. I was here once preaching before, but they said, get out. So I preached outside, uh, but it was in the summer and I kind of figured that I would be inside this time. And given the weather, I am pleased uh, to do so. The scripture reading this morning is one in which a question is asked of Jesus. The scripture reading was read from Matthew 22, 15 to 22. There are other portions of scripture that really have exactly the same question. They're in the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call the synoptic gospels. John is one of the four gospels also, but it has kind of a different emphasis to it. So the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each contain the passage somewhat different, but the question is the same. The circumstances are the same. So it's exactly the same as situation, but given from the perspective of Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, those gospels. And you might think that in this question, what's the big deal? A question was asked of Jesus, he answered it, and life moved on. But that's the thing. That's the beauty of scripture. As you look into it more so, you can see some things. I'm not talking about new things. I always have a yellow flag or a red flag that goes up when they say, oh, I see something new in scripture. No, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to say that if you look at some things in scripture, which we're going to do today, you can appreciate the question. And I think you can be overwhelmed with the answer. So in the context of each of these passages, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that relate this question, there are people that are ganging up on Jesus. I'm going to mention more about that in the sermon. My question is who? As I said, we'll do that. Why are they ganging up? We're going to look at that too. What did they want to accomplish? And how did Jesus handle it? And also, is there anything for us? 2023? April, Chinese Gospel Church of North York. Is there anything here for you to learn? Is there anything here for me to learn? These are some of the things that we're going to be looking at today. Before I do so, let me just ask God to bless his word, challenge my heart and your heart too. Father, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. You have an amazing way of doing so. Help us to open ourselves to you. I've realized that there are many distractions in the world. Some may be playful, they can be games or thoughts or phones. There can be some that are difficult to deal with. It could be the health of a loved one, it could be a relationship, it could be job, it could be money. But for this period of time, help us to focus on you. Help us to focus on your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So my sermon title is Don't Shortchange God. Well, that's not my sermon title, but that's the purpose. That's what I want to look at today. And I just realized I, I forgot something. Um, I meant to bring a pencil with me, but unfortunately, if I give it back to you, you you're not going to like it, the form that I give it back to you. So, so it's, it's a dangerous thing. I'll pay you for it, though. Um, does anybody have a pencil that they would like to give me? Now, okay, thank you. Um, give me just a moment. And I apologize for what I'm going to do to your pencil later, but excuse me again. I'm not hiding, I just didn't see that it uh, was free at that end. So there's three things that I'm gonna be looking at today. The context, which I think is extremely important for us to understand here. The question itself, what's involved in the question, and then the answer, it seems pretty straightforward, but there's a zing at the end of it that I think will really touch each of our hearts. So in context, and we're gonna be looking at the Matthew passage, we see that the event that is recorded here, 
uh, the question of paying taxes to Caesar, is after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You remember that. We, we celebrate that in Palm Sunday. Jesus coming in on the foal of a donkey and, you know, the palm branches and the coats uh, on the donkey and on the road. And so it's a huge time of celebration. His opponents, though, the religious leaders, are getting desperate. The Passover is coming close. The popularity of Jesus is rising, demonstrated by the reaction of the people to his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the religious leaders, on top of being anxious about things, literally hate Jesus. And in fact, they are looking at any opportunity they have to discredit him and ultimately to get rid of him, to kill him. That's part of the context. Now, you might say, mm, how important is context? I love this illustration. Do you know that the Bible actually says there is no God? It does. But let me read the context for you. Prover or Psalm 14.1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Changes the question or it changes the circumstances completely, doesn't it? There is no God, but the fool has said in his heart. So if somebody says to you, and you're just mentioning about the importance of context, just remember Psalm 14.1, because if they pick and choose what they want in Scripture to try to provide uh, a reason why they don't believe it, you can just say, well, context is so important. Do you have an example? Yeah, actually I do. Think of Psalm 14.1. So the context makes a different, a, a, a huge difference in so many cases. It can, it can uh, include history, it can include geography, details, explanations, all of these different things. So what does the context say here? In Matthew 21, 1 to 11, so I'm looking at a few passages before. In Matthew 21, 1 to 11, it recounts the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Immediately after, Jesus cleanses the temple by throwing out money chambers. They were corrupt. They were trying to make a buck for themselves. People would, uh, you know, come in and they'd have to purchase a specific coin. I'm going to be mentioning that this morning. They'd have to purchase a specific coin and they'd overcharge for it. Or if they would bring in a sacrifice, they would say, oh, you know what? The sacrifice has a blemish. Could be a dove, could be a lamb. It has a blemish. You can't use it. But good news, we have more. You can buy one right here. And because it was a time of celebration and people had to have this, they would overcharge for it. So the people that were in the temple weren't there for the benefit of the people, but they were for the benefit of themselves. So they're corrupt. They're trying to make extra money. And so what did Jesus do? He accused these men. That they make it the temple a den of robbers and threw them out. Later on in Matthew, Matthew 21, 14 to 15, it says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They didn't like what Jesus was doing. So the religious leaders were upset with Jesus and so mad that they wanted to kill him just a little bit after the question. In Matthew 26, 1 to, 1 to 5, it says this. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. Right there in Matthew. But they said, not during the feast, that there, lest there be an uproar from the people. So back to Matthew 21, in 23 to 27, uh, they tried. They tried to challenge the authority of Jesus, and they failed. And then right after that, there's three parables. The parable of the two sons in 21, 28 to 32. 
the parable of the tenants, 21, 33 to 46, and the result was in 21, 45 to 46, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, including the two that I just mentioned, they perceived he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. And a third parable that Jesus mentioned was the parable out of the wedding feast in 22, 1 to 13. Now is our passage right after that. Here, they tried to trap Jesus in his words, specifically by getting him to answer the question. So the first point is the context, and we now get to the second point. The question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, talk about a loaded question. We're going to see how it's a loaded question. You know, they say that there's a couple of questions or there's a couple of topics you never talk about with other people. Death and taxes. Well, we might not be happy with taxes. I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. But that's the question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It seems that some people ask you questions just to put you on the spot. It could be morals. It could be uh, what you're doing, how you spend money, how you, how you view people. Um, there's lots of questions that are loaded questions, and people aren't asking for you to give an answer. They're asking you a question to put you on the spot and then to intimidate you. Well, that's what happened here. Let me just refer to some of the passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the question seems very simple on the service, but it was asked, Matthew records, to entangle him. In Mark, it's to trap him. Back in Matthew, out of malice. And also in Matthew and in Mark, hypocrisy. It was asked out of hypocrisy. In Luke, he says it's a pretense of sincerity that they used, and also in Luke, of craftiness. So you know, using these words, that they didn't mean a simple question, but a question which seemingly it was impossible for Jesus to answer. It was an invasive question. It was a politicized question, and we're going to see that also. It was a hot potato explosive question. You see, on the one hand, you have, and it mentions right here in the Word of God in this passage, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees did not believe that the Jews should pay taxes to Rome, that it was invasive, that they should not do it. On the other hand, they joined up with the Herodians, and the Herodians had come to kind of an agreement with Rome, and so they said, yes, it is okay for Jews to pay taxes to Rome. So on the one hand, you have a setup for a no-win answer. If Jesus had said, yes, it is right for us to pay taxes to Caesar, the Pharisees would have said, whoa, whoa, we can't do that. He's a traitor to Israel. But if on the other hand, he said, no, it's not right to pay taxes to Caesar. The Herodians would have said, whoa, what are, you, what are you doing? You're a traitor to Rome. So either way that he answered, they were kind of thinking, <laughs> we got him. Two answers. Or, yeah, one question, either of two answers, we got him. Whichever way he answers, we can discredit him. So it was a setup. And to make it worse, and you can see what it mentions here in Matthew, that they didn't, um, they didn't ask this question lightly, but they were trying to set him up. Let me, read, let me read what it says in Luke, in the Luke passage. In Luke 20, 19 to 26, it records this passage. And in verse 21, it says, so they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly, and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. 
In, in my culture, you know, we talk about brown nosing, not sure where the origin of that came from, or sucking up to someone saying, oh, you're, you're so good, you're so great, you're, you're so wonderful. Uh, let's ask you this question. They were pretending to be nice, but it was out of malice that they were asking this question. It was a sucker punch, so to speak. So the summary of the question is this. The Pharisees and the Herodians, bitter enemies, were ganging up on Jesus. They gave him a seemingly impossible question to answer. So we come to his answer. First of all, the context, we need to understand that to appreciate what's going on here. The question, we need to delve into that a little bit more and see that it's not as simple as it appears because it was a setup. And so we have the answer. There's a few things that I want to mention in, in the answer. It was simple. He said, show me a coin. Now, I realize that, that you're too far away to see this, but this is a dime. And why do I hold that up? That's about the size of the coin that was used here, a denarius. So that's about the size of the coin. He says, show me the coin in Matthew 22, 19 and 20. Show me the coin for the tax. They brought him a denarius and Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Remember I mentioned before that the money changers would sell the coin to the Jews to use for paying the taxes to Caesar? You see, they couldn't use their Jewish coins. They had to use the specific coin, the denarius, and they would be overcharged for it. So a denarius was a coin that was used for the paying of this tax. And from the ESV study Bible, it says this, on the one side of the silver denarius was a profile of Tiberius Caesar with the Latin inscription, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, around the coin's perimeter. On the opposite side was a picture of the Roman goddess of peace, Pax, with the Latin inscription, high priest. So the point that Jesus was making, this is Caesar's coin. It had his picture, it had his inscription, and it was to be given back to him. So even though it was anathema or, or bad news or wrong in, 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 in religious Jewish uh, individuals' lives, to use a coin like this, it was degrading for them the Ten Commandments, don't make any image, don't, don't, uh, don't ascribe deity to any other individual. And the coin had both of those things that, that was wrong with them. But Jesus's answer, simple answer was, whose coin is it? It's Caesar's. Give it back to him. His answer was more than simple. It was brilliant. Instead of being able to accuse Jesus of tre treason, the Herodians or the Pharisees, both of them, they could do nothing. You see, with one simple answer, Jesus gave ownership of the coin to Caesar. Effectively, he took the wind out of the sails, the argument, the, the case that both the Pharisees and the, and the Herodians were trying to make that Jesus was a traitor either to Israel or Rome. But the answer was also unexpected. <laughs> the Pharisees and the Herodians never anticipated this answer. They had, the Pharisees had been appoised to accuse Jesus of treason to Israel, and the Herodians had been um, poised to say you're a traitor to Rome if you say you shouldn't pay taxes. But Jesus answered that no, it's not about that. Whose coin is it? If it's Caesar's, give it back to him. Uh, but here's a part that we need to understand. The answer is simple, much more than that. Brilliant, much more than that. Unexpected, much more than that. It is also convicting. In Matthew twenty two twenty six, the last half of the verse, it says, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. And for religious leaders to become silent 
is pretty incredible, I know. They became silent. You see, the answer is more than just give to Caesar what is owed to him. And if we don't understand that, I think we miss the point of this passage. In 2221, it says this, then he said to them, after looking at the coin, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It's his coin, give it back to him. But this part, and to God, the things that are God's. What did they owe to Caesar? His coin, money, taxes. What did they, what do we, what do I owe to God? Well, there's a few things in that. First of all, we need to understand, and again, Scripture tells us very directly, Genesis 1 and 2, God is the creator of the whole world, including the first two people, Adam and Eve. God created the world. That doesn't mean that, that God knows everyone, and that everyone knows God, but God created us all. So in terms of creation theology, we owe him literally our lives. And he is also the father of all those who trust in his provision for salvation, who is Jesus Christ. Money is the context of this question, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? So I don't think that the answer is all about money, but I think I would be wrong to understand the context of it, not to say anything about money. So do we owe money to God? And that's kind of like a, a duh question. Of course we do. And how much? Well, literally everything. Now, we need homes, we need food, we need all these things. But for some people to say, um, oh, we should tithe and only tithe. And if you hit the 10%, you are legalistically being good. God doesn't want legalism in our heart. God wants a desire to honor him. So whether it's 10 or 15 or 20% or more, or like the widow with the two mites, she basically gave everything. She dropped a couple of inconspicuous coins and Jesus praised her for what she did. And I've known some people during periods of their lives don't think that they can do much, but they do at least a little bit. And also we are created in God's image. What does that mean? Well, I believe that it gives us the opportunity of knowing him and to represent him to others. So let me ask you this question. I don't know all of you. I, I'd love to know all of you. I learned a few names this morning. Um, John, Dunstan, Anne, uh, Richard. But I might be hard pressed to, to say to every individual the right name. I might, you know, mix it up. But God knows each one of us. Do you know him? You see, the gospel is this. There is a God. God created the world. Man sinned against God, and all of us have this blemish of sin in our lives. Jesus Christ came from heaven. He is God who took on flesh. He lived. He died. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He died as our Savior. Do you believe this? And more importantly, have you trusted him as your savior? Do you know God? You know God by trusting Jesus Christ as your savior. This is the focus of what Jesus is saying in this passage. Give to God what is God's because he created you, because Jesus died, paid for our sins, rose victoriously from the dead and is preparing a place for us. And also, I mentioned about the image of God, we have the opportunity of representing him. Now, Jesus gave a commission to the disciples, and I believe that it still stands to this day. Matthew 20, 19 and 20. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what will I do? What will you do? Yes, it's, to me, it's almost fun. I don't mean to be blasphemous in scripture, but it's almost fun to look at the context, to look at the question, to see some of these details, to understand that it's a more intricate question, to understand that, that Jesus was being set up. Yeah, that's kind of neat. But then I come up to this question, give to God. What is God's? My life, my soul, my all. There's a song. I meant to bring the words with me so I don't dare sing it to you because I'll mess up the words, but there's a song, I Surrender All. And I think that captures what this passage is saying. Give to God what is God's. Now, some people say, okay, I'll give you 10%. I'm, I'm not speaking just money. I'll give you 10% of my life. And you can think, really? God gave all of that to you? He created you? He sent his son Jesus to die for you? He created us in his image? He commissions us? And we only want to give him 10% of our lives, of our thoughts, of our time, of our efforts, of our thinking, of our heart? It's horrible. Some people might say, God, tell you what, I'm feeling good. I want to give you 50% of my life, God. And here is where I apologize for the pencil. Now you know what I'm going to do? We're saying to God, you know what? I'll give you half of my life. But I'm not going to be entirely committed to you because there's some things that I want to do. There's some things that I want to think of. There's some things that I want to participate in. So God, I'm not going to give you 100%. I'm going to give you 50% of my life. I believe that the only appropriate response that we should have according to this passage, when Jesus gave his all for us, that we give our all to him. Is it boring? Is it sad? Is it horrible? No. Just read about the Apostle Paul, who was a vehement enemy of Jesus Christ. And he came to him as Savior, and he paid an enormous price. Some of the things that happened to him were absolutely horrible, being stoned almost to death, being whipped, you know, suffering uh, shipwreck, and then ultimately probably being beheaded, church history tells us. And his response to his life, I can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens me. And he, count, he counted it all joy to serve him. So the only appropriate response that we can give God is that we surrender all to him. Now, I want to be honest with you. That will come with sorrow and gladness, with pain and joy, with trials and blessings. Let me close with a very familiar psalm, but I think it's very appropriate at this point in time. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Doesn't he ignore the difficulties and the problems that we have in life? Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
What a promise. I want to challenge you here this morning, in person, online, to serve God with all that you have. All that you have. Let's pray. Father, this is a very convicting passage when we understand the context and the uh, shenanigans going on behind the scene with the, with the question, but with the answer, such a simple and yet convicting answer, and one that we need to consider. Help us, Lord, to say yes. I want to send, surrender all to Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.